Recording has been started. Good morning, everyone in United States. And good evening to our distinguished speaker from India and any other folks who are joining from India. My name is Dr. Adityanji, and I'm the president of CSA. We are here for our monthly series, uh, which is a distinguished lecture series under the auspices of CSA. And we have a very, very distinguished speaker for us today, Professor Reshmi Kazi. Those of you who registered probably saw this flyer of ours. And Professor Kazi will be speaking today on universal nuclear disarmament and the risk of nuclear war. Little bit about Council for Strategic Affairs. Council for Strategic Affairs imparts education in the field of international relations. Council fosters discussion, dialogue, and debate on geopolitical issues. CSA encourages strategic studies in general to raise the level of awareness. CSA condemns terrorism in all forms worldwide. CSA aims to contribute towards world peace and prosperity. And you see at the bottom our URL of our website. We do a monthly roundtable discussion that is held on second Saturday of each month at 10 a.m. Eastern Daytime. We have a monthly guest lecture by a domain expert on the fourth Saturday of each month at 10 a.m. EDT. We also organize symposia, meetings, and conferences. We promote publications of articles on geopolitics and related subjects. And finally, we have a summer internship program that is for college students. And as I stated, this is our esteemed speaker for today, Professor Reshmi Kazi. You'll be seeing her fairly soon speak. Professor Kazi is serving as a faculty member and professor at the Nelson Mandela Center for Peace and Conflict Resolution at Jamia Millia University in Delhi. In the past, she was an associate fellow at Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis in New Delhi. Her area of expertise includes India's nuclear weapon policy, nuclear uh, non-proliferation studies, nuclear security, nuclear terrorism, and global nuclear disarmament. She also follows issues related to bioterrorism, chemical terrorism, and has written and published on these issues. She has a doctorate degree from Disarmament Disease Division, Center for International Politics. Uh, she has been at School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi. Areas of spe specialization in doctoral thesis was on evolution of India's nuclear doctrine, a study of political, economic, and technological dimensions. As I stated, she has earlier worked as a research fellow at Manohar Parikar Institute, uh, sorry, at IPCS, Institute of Peace and Conflict Studies in New Delhi. And during this period, she worked on project title Weapons of Mass Destruction in South Asia, which was funded by NTI, Nuclear Threat Initiative. And while she was at Manohar Parikar Institute of Defense Studies and Analysis, she published a monograph titled Nuclear Terrorism, the New Terror of 21st Century. I'm very pleased to say that this is not the first time Professor Kazi is coming on our platform. I uh, vividly remember two years ago, during the COVID time when we started doing online activities, she was our first speaker on our online platform. And we are very, very delighted that she has chosen to come back to on our platform once again. Uh, because of her expertise in this area, I'm not going to say a single word on the topic at large. Usually I do introduce the topic, but I'm going to save some time 
and I would let the expert speak rather than try to introduce the topic. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's my distinct honor to welcome Professor Reshmi Kazi. I may not be, uh, you know, uh, sort of uh, off the mark if I say that she is the foremost academician and scholar from India who specializes on nuclear disarmament. So, Professor Kazi, the floor is yours. Welcome. I am already left speechless, <laughs> Dr. Adyanji. Thank you so much for those kind words. I hope I deserve them. I think I'm only a student. I am also learning the subject. This is uh, this is an area which is uh, you know like ever evolving, uh, and there is so much going on. So uh, I sometimes I feel I'm still not adequately you know uh, uh, well versed with the sub subject. There's so much yet to uh, you know like uh, understand and uh, imbibe from. Uh, but uh, I will try to make a humble attempt uh, today, uh, uh, and I hope I live up to your expectations uh, uh, and uh, all the others, all the distinguished uh, uh, guests out here. Uh, but, uh, of course, uh, thank you once again, uh, Dr. Adyanji and the Council of uh, Strategic Affairs for having me here again once more. Uh, and um, uh, good morning to everyone uh, uh, in the U.S. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, good evening uh, to all uh, colleagues, uh, uh, senior uh, colleagues here in India um, and my uh, colleagues as well. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, uh, issue on nuclear disarmament uh, and it is um, uh, clubbed with the issue of nuclear risk, uh, the, the, the war, uh, you know, the risk of nuclear war. Uh, and uh, it's a very difficult uh, situation that we are undergoing uh, right now. Uh, and talking about this uh, concept, uh, I don't know how, how I should uh, approach this. Uh, but uh, the thing is, one thing is, uh, which is constant out here is that when we are talking about nuclear weapons, uh, we understand we are, we are essentially talking about something, uh, in fact, the most terrifying technology which, you know, like human beings have ever discovered. And the uh, uh, events of Hiroshima and uh, Nagasaki, uh, you know, they have uh, today's, uh, the weapons that we have today, the, you know, it only makes us feel, uh, it, it triples and maybe even quadruples the terror that was witnessed in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Today's disruptive technologies uh, and all the modernized weapons uh, that has that are being discovered, you know, uh, and and the investment that is going on, the funding that is going on in these uh, development of these weapons, it just makes us feel that you know the potential crisis is completely running uh, out of control. Uh, it, it's pretty high. The risk factor is very high here. In fact, we are already ninety seconds to midnight. This was hundred seconds. Some. You know, like a month or so back, it was 100 seconds to midnight, according to the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. Uh, but yes, we are still 90 seconds to midnight. And so we face a situation where nuclear weapons, you know, we have we have presented mankind with a historic dilemma with their, where their non-use, which, you know, essentially reads as uh, deterrence, remains only the sensible use, uh, though nations have been, you know, preparing for nuclear war fighting as part of building credible deterrence. And uh, in this context, uh, we all know the Russian crisis, the Ukraine-Russian crisis, uh, which has already completed one year. Um, how uh, you know how it amplifies this uh, risk, the risk of nuclear war. What we essentially you know see uh, in the backdrop of the Ukraine crisis uh, is that if you want peace, uh, prepare for war. And uh, uh, the the tragic part is you have to prepare for the war and stay armed to the teeth for that. Otherwise, uh, what we are witnessing at present uh, is something, you know, which has uh, really, uh, you know, it seeks to destabilize the, the political order, the domestic order, uh, and in fact, the global nuclear order. So, although, you know, like pursuing uh, global disarmament was the basic premise of uh, Article 6 uh, of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, uh, the 
current play of nuclear disarmament, uh, nevertheless, you know, as we see, it it sort of spins a very complex web of uh, two steps forward and step backward. This is what we are, you know, essentially facing. Uh, good part is uh, the the year 2022. We began with a newfound optimism, you know, amongst um, the disarmament proponents, and in a rare gesture, all the uh, in fact, very rare gesture, all the five permanent members of the UN Security Council, uh, uh, you know, the five nuclear weapon states, uh, as recognized by the NPT, they finally managed to issue for the first time a joint statement underlining that a nuclear war cannot be won and must never be fought. Uh, earlier, of course, uh, uh, similar statement was, uh, you know, sounded off. We have heard it from Regan Gorbachev's 90, 90, uh, 1985 statement, uh, uh, 1980, 1985 summit. Uh, you know, during that time, we've heard similar uh, 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 statement. And uh, even um, recently, uh, Biden and Putin, uh, they have also issued similar statement in June 2021. Uh, but then 2022, statement uh, from uh, the from all the p5 countries what was itself you know it, it spelled a lot of uh, optimism but at the same time i do not want to really dampen out here put a dampener here the thing is even though it came from the five nuclear weapon states uh, the non uh, so called non nuclear weapon state uh, or or the non uh, the, uh, the 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 four countries who are at the same time, nuclear capable, uh, the nuclear armed states, if I can put it that way, or nuclear state possessors, they were kept out of this. So I, I found that, you know, that is why I say it, it is a two step uh, forward, but at the same time, one step backward. Uh, somehow I feel the, um, the nuclear, other nuclear armed states should have been also included here. So um, if we have to look uh, at the state of nuclear disarmament from this back, from the background, you know, we uh, it highlights two salient transformations. First, there is a lack of adequate commitment amongst the P5 countries um, um, towards the implementation of the NPT, uh, particularly Article 6, uh, which mandates uh, nuclear disarmament. And at the same time, what happens is that it erodes the credibility, their credibility, particularly amongst the non-nuclear weapon states. And secondly, where the gap is coming here, you know, the huge gap that is uh, uh, sort of emerging, um, we have seen several civil society and other non-state actors like Pawash Movement, the International Campaign to Abolish uh, Nuclear Weapons, ICANN, that is, you know, International Cro Council of Red Cross, etc. They have a Global Zero, they have emerged as new leading players so far as piloting um, uh, nuclear disarmament campaigns. Uh, and of course, introducing new tools, techniques, and outcomes uh, expecting the P5 to fall in line. So it, this itself, uh, you know, the, the resounding effort that uh, the international non-governmental uh, organizations are putting in itself is, uh, uh, it, it makes it very evident how much, uh, you know, the P5 countries needs to fall in line uh, uh, to, to fulfill the objectives under uh, Article 6 of the NPT. Now, if you're looking into the highs and lows of nuclear disarmament, the 1970s and 1980s were, you know, decades where we saw major peace and nuclear freeze movements across Europe. Uh, uh, there were initiatives uh, like the action plans presented by the UN General Secretary, by India's own, you know, our young Prime Minister uh, uh, that time, the then Prime Minister uh, Rajiv Gandhi. But they were all, you know, they, they had little avail and they were completely uh, sort of generally sidelined. Uh, in 1963, again, Kennedy administration had estimated that the world uh, would be having as many as 25 nuclear weapon states by 19 by the 1970s. But of course, you know, as we see, so more than 75 years after the you know discovery of nuclear weapons, the the P5 countries, along with the NPT-led non-proliferation regime, they have uh, the number has been limited only to it has not crossed double digit. Uh, it's only you know uh, four more. That is India, Israel, North Korea, and Pakistan. Uh, they were able to cross the nuclear Rubicon, and uh, uh, though they have uh, a relatively small arsenal, but again, their uh, you know uh, the very fact that they are um, sort of uh, their policies are also influenced by what is happening on the larger global scale 
uh, the nuclear policies particularly, how they are being influenced by the you know, P5 countries is something which we need to be mindful about. So uh, uh, while the owners of nuclear disarmament has therefore remained with the P5 countries, uh, you know, uh, or with particularly the US and uh, Russia, um, uh, as these uh, two countries, you know, they hold more than 90% of the world's uh, total nuclear stockpiles. The optics are that, you know, their weapons are also the most diversely deployed around the uh, planet. And uh, uh, moreover, while reducing the nuclear stockpiles, while they talk about, you know, reduction of nuclear stockpiles, um, they have also continued to modernize uh, these weapons. And so as a result, even in the face of this strong nuclear taboo uh, and fairly effective non-proliferation regime, the argument that, you know, nuclear weapon being the ultimate currency of power has actually continued to thrive, you know, even as we are speaking to, we are, we are, we are talking here, um, the salience has not really reduced. It has not been mitigated. And the tragic part is it is also inspiring other countries at the same time, particularly, as I said, you know, the, the other nuclear armed uh, uh, possessors. While you know we can say that the non-governmental meetings see uh, nuclear weapon states and the nuclear armed uh, st uh, possessors express their commitment for eliminating nuclear weapons, but of course there remains a wide disparity in their profession and practice. And so nuclear disarmament vision, as we see, they are ungirded, undergirded by their nuclear deterrent strategies. The resultant, the consequential effect is that you know the failure of nearly half of the NPT's five-year uh, review conferences that were expected to provide you know, essential framework for the pursuit of nuclear disarmament failed even to produce a consensus document. The same goes for the last 10th uh, you know, review conference as well. So, and, and moreover, there is uh, uh, so many years after uh, uh, the nuclear weapons that have been discovered and we know uh, what are the uh, huge risk factors that they have they, they involve, we still do not have any agreement on nuclear security assurances. So if you, uh, at this stage, if we, do, if we take a reality check, uh, uh, you know, despite uh, some of these uh, foresaid notable achievements in the field of nuclear disarmament, you know, the, the two former superpowers, uh, they have remained propagating, you know, disarmament from the prism of, as we see, national security. And uh, they have been, uh, while they have been denying nuclear technologies to others, uh, they have not, you know, uh, sort of uh, uh, refrained from constantly modernizing their own, you know, uh, uh, so as to, uh, particularly when it comes to phasing out their older uh, inventories. And uh, it can be said uh, with a fair degree of uh, 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 conviction that the CTPT and the FMCT, uh, which are again very important arms control measures, uh, they have banned bang but not the bomb uh, that's quite tragic uh, so what we see today is that a weekend npt uh, which is uh, which is meant to be the axis of the uh, multilateral non proliferation regime i mean we can have a lot of criticism against the npt but one also needs to uh, express uh, you know uh, sort of uh, uh, we, we must express this understanding uh, that NPT still remains a multilateral uh, non-proliferation access, uh, non-proliferation regime built around the P5 uh, commitment for disarmament. Uh, but again, as we see uh, with the, uh, the situation that is uh, evident on a global scale, uh, it has been crippled, its ability has been crippled to collectively set the tone and tenor of global nuclear disarmament narratives, uh, leaving it to disparative you know, individual trajectories. So from P5, we now have P5 plus four, uh, and this has weakened the non-proliferation norm uh, definitely. It, the, the, and, and we know the weaker the norm, the lesser the compliance. Um, in fact, we can, uh, it, it's P5 plus four, but the way situation is unfolding, particularly on the uh, Russia-Ukraine crisis, uh, there is a sort of, you know, uh, a narrative which is unfolding, um, uh, that certain countries, you know, particularly uh, countries, uh, I mean, like, uh, uh, they, they should not have given up on their nuclear weapons. And uh, Ukraine is uh, one such uh, um, case in point. Uh, it had uh, given up its nuclear uh, uh, weapons and it had joined the NPT on the assurance 
that you know it would not be attacked but what is happening today is completely uh, you know uh, is a reneging of the promises that were made to the uh, made to ukraine now a look at the p5 countries uh, very briefly of course uh, us uh, the only country the sole country to fire a nuclear weapon anger uh, it has remained embedded uh, you know the central tenets of nuclear uh, disarmament upon the principles of nuclear disarmament nuclear deterrence and extended nuclear deterrence to its allies russia other case in point it has issued nuclear threats to ukraine and of late it has suspended the uh, the new star treaty the only uh, you know treaty uh, which you know probably the entire nuclear order was so hopeful about in terms of uh, strengthening the nuclear arms control regime which is so so you know affected uh, in the given world order uh, but it has suspended the treaty uh, and uh, it has even uh, issued nuclear warning uh, in case us is uh, going ahead with nuclear test uh, russia will also not refrain from it france no significant movement against uh, nuclear uh, disarmament um, there's a reservation against a no first use and its nuclear disarmament remains premised again on nuclear deterrence that entails ensuring integrity uh, of its own territory, the safety of its people, and sovereignty by threatening to deliver unacceptable damage wherever it comes from and in whatever shape and form. UK. Nuclear disarmament vision of uh, UK as a global player remains premised upon their belief that nuclear weapons are an integral part of their defense doctrine and that these have played a crucial role not just in safeguarding against uncertainties and risks but also in obtaining crucial influence on the US and in NATO strategies. In fact, they maintain nuclear stockpiles as source of their continued international stature, stature and prestige. China. US conventional superiority and nuclear capabilities has triggered China's overall military modernization. Now, in this category, we have, uh, uh, we have nuclear haves, we have nuclear have-nots, and there is a new category, nuclear need-nots. Now, among the non-nuclear weapon states, we know that there is a, almost if I go by the statistics, available statistics, 89% of the non-nuclear weapon states, they have, you know, criticized the ban on uh, 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 the nuclear test ban, uh, the, sorry, the nuclear ban treaty. Why? Because they are umbrella states and uh, that belong to an alliance with a nuclear power and are actively seeking to join such an alliance. Now, the, uh, you can criticize that or, you know, you can, you can also, uh, uh, there are advocates for it. Uh, but the thing is, given the US, uh, 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 given the, uh, the Ukraine crisis, the Russia-Ukraine crisis, we need to look at this narrative again. You know, there is a, there is a need to relook at it. Why, as in like why these countries are essentially the, the nuclear need nots, you know, why they have this sort of a narrative. We understand that you know there is no clear pathway for forging a just peace that and discourages future aggression under the shadow of nuclear weapons but at a minimum you know like the united states must uh, you know it needs to keep the door open for more engagement more dialogue particularly with russia you know in order to reduce and mitigate the dangerous risks uh, uh, involving uh, uh, you know the, the nuclear risks um, which the war the ongoing war is fostering uh, uh, on a daily basis, we can say. And uh, one element of risk reduction, you know, it inv involves that there are high level US military to military contacts with Russia in order to reduce the likelihood of miscalculation, which is again, a very high uh, chance given the AI, uh, uh, the artificial intelligence, the disruptive technologies, the modernization in weapons that are taking place at a, you know, like a, a, a very accelerated scale. Uh, so there is we there are multi uh, multitude channels of you know uh, dialogue uh, they all need to be explored at this level because uh, there is a need to find a path uh, you know to serious peace negotiations which could go a long way in reducing the risk of escalation uh, because what we are facing now is an unprecedented global danger uh, uh, and and we know there is a need for concerted action uh, you know, it, it is required and every second counts. As I said, right at the beginning, right at the outside, uh, outside that we are just 90 seconds, you know, to midnight. There's also a need uh, to
to see the fact that you know uh, any attempt to destabilize political situation in any country you know this will also backfire so uh, what is important here is that uh, uh, i mean geopolitics they have their own agenda but what is also important is that we uh, uh, that that countries refrain from taking the bait and and resort more to consultations to dialogue and response uh, you know appropriately uh, there are several other factors that is sort of uh, aggravating the nuclear uh, risk uh, like the uh, you know the sort of insecurity mistrust uh, that is uh, playing uh, and and people and players uh, nuclear players prefer to stay in competition rather than to reach any agreement what is uh, also what we have seen um, uh, the it's a it's a different uh, scenario now it's no longer the bipolar world or the uh, after the cold war uh, the ways uh, things have been evolving um, between us and russia uh, and both were mindful of the fact they had the distrust of each other but what we have seen that they also had arms control agreements uh, between them uh, unfortunately many of them have uh, sort of uh, it's it's defunct uh, the inf and now the new star treaty you know this is also uh, i don't know it it was all once it was on the verge of uh, you know it had to be resuscitated back and it's still with one russia suspending it i don't know how where it is heading now but uh, uh, the thing is players prefer to stay in competition rather than you know reach uh, agreement uh, it's like a game theory which is going on here uh, so power balances strategic goals arsenals you know which which are evolving uh, they are profoundly in a state of flux uh, added to this there are technology alliances uh, globalization has been accelerated and amplified so it is very difficult to define it's easier said that you know that we should not take the bait there should be more dialogue but the thing is very hard to define a stable state of relations among countries uh, that have different and, and unfortunately quite unpredictable goals and assets. Uh, so in the scenario now we have US, Russia and China and this tripolar world is uh, very unpredictable. Uh, it's an untested, unlike the bipolar world uh, uh, during the uh, Cold War days, which was a more tested uh, uh, you know, uh, world the tripolar world appears to be very untested so there is a lot of unpredictability uh, which is uh, involved here uh, moreover the boundaries are also getting blurred uh, with the development of new types of weapons uh, emerging technologies hypersonic gliders precision guided uh, you know strike system robots artificial intelligence cyber attacks you name it all it's all there you know command and control uh, systems uh, uh, running the risk of uh, cyber attacks uh, uh confuse uh, decision making uh, we had seen what happened during the uh, cuban missile crisis uh, the more the technology there is also the risk of uh, you know uh, uh, running the risk uh, the risk factor is also getting uh, on the on the higher side and the suspension of the new star treaty this is definitely not something uh, good news uh, uh, which is uh, we are confronted with uh, because the treaty at least provided a basis for a verification uh, regime, um, and it it was a very important uh, you know measure, uh, arms control measure. Uh, because as a as a professor of arms control myself, when I am delivering my lectures, when I am you know taking my classes, I find I'm so baffled. I'm talking about nuclear disarmament on one hand and and arms control on the other hand. Uh, but what is the positive thing that I am able to convey to my students? nothing there is total negativity uh there is there is you know like and now this this is a new thing which is you know added to this uh whole uh, uh this this uh, uh you know the nuclear order which so much already under challenge so uh the treaty which at least provided you know some sort of a, a basis for verification regime now this also stands at a uh you know it's it's a very uncertain uh future uh the the fact is um uh, the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons again uh, we all know it was it has uh, it was not uh, uh, supported by the p5 countries not even the new, other nuclear armed states and uh, it's an important measure of disarmament diplomacy but uh, without the support of the uh, nuclear weapon states it uh, its future again runs quite bleak uh, 
In the final analysis, I would say that uh, nuclear weapons, you know, uh, states, they must realize that meaningful efforts towards nuclear disarmament can uh, be ignored only at the great peril for the future of mankind. Because to help humankind rise to the challenge of our collective survival, you know, it's not a choice. Uh, an ethical obligation uh, to our human, you know, uh, fellow human being, to our own species. So, logic of armed uh, states, you know, that deep reductions and subsequent abolitions of nuclear weapons cannot be initiated without assurances of security and strategic stability. Uh, this is uh, it's prone to be used as a pretext for maintaining the status quo. But uh, we all know that uh, this can prove to be a very defective insurance policy. Uh, because there is no guarantee uh, that this status quo will continue uh, in the complex world uh, order. And uh, uh, instead of having precarious peace, uh, which is so unpredictable, uh, we can all hope to have something, you know, which is more positive peace and, and stable peace. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Professor Kazi, for this very enlightening lecture and uh, considering the state of affairs international scenario at this point in time perhaps after the cuban missile crisis this is the next you know critical time in the history of the international relations the risk of nuclear war is at its highest. I think steps have to be taken to diffuse the situation because you cannot actually dissociate conventional geopolitics from universal nuclear disarmament. And if you let, look at Russia's suspension of the New START Treaty, that happened one day after Joe Biden went to Kiev. There are a lot of threatening bellicose statements coming from Biden administration about quote unquote dismantling the Russian Federation just like we did dismantle the Soviet Union. So you have to understand what is going on and why this happened. Bottom line is that the N5, I won't call them the P5, the N5, been totally dishonest uh, in achieving universal nuclear disarmament. They could have, they should have, but they did not. That's why we are at this situation that we are now. So I'm going to start taking the questions from our audience and they are already putting in the chat function. So I'll go each question one by one and then you can answer. Let's start with a question from Mr. Vijay Nilikeni, who is a nuclear energy expert. And the question is the real challenge to nuclear disarmament is massive deficit of, of mutual trust between all nuclear armed states. Several of them are totally opaque, like China, North Korea, Pakistan, and wannabe nuclear weapon state Iran. How this can be addressed and resolved? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you, sir, for uh, uh, this is a very important question. Um, but again, a very difficult question. How can we address and resolve? The only way to address a distrust, a mutual distrust, is through dialogue, through diplomacy, through transparency, through verification. And I know these are very challenging uh, suggestions. I cannot say solutions because uh, solutions, they take time uh, before they become solutions. But there can be incremental steps um we uh, uh, we cannot uh, reach solution in one day what is important is that we take incremental steps towards reaching those solutions 
most important uh, aspect out here uh, would be to understand that nuclear weapons which are uh, they were you know there is a security element uh, uh, involved here but along with this the, those weapons which were made for the security of the territorial security or for the you know the national security or for the people the population these weapons cannot uh, you know in the name of security cannot be used to you know um, uh, uh, move towards an Armageddon. We have already seen uh, Hiroshima, Nagasaki, the bombs that were used during those times, 14, 15 kiloton. Today we have bombs with thermonuclear nuclear weapons uh, with more than 100 kiloton. And uh, we can't even imagine, uh, but uh, we, we do get, uh, you know, uh, uncomfortable uh, when we think about it. So uh, I think uh, the only way uh, Distrust uh, can be mutual distrust uh, among all the nuclear armed states that can be addressed is uh, the fact that we need to have uh, more dialogue. Uh, China also needs to, uh, specifically China, as I said, the tripolar world is so untested. The very fact China is not willing to join arms control, uh, you know, uh, initiative. Uh, though there have been suggestions from the US. Uh, but again, there are geopolitics involved here. Uh, it's very important that that's, China is one important missing factor when it comes to addressing specifically the concept of distrust. So the more uh, you know, we are able to uh, invest in this instead of having, a, having played a game theory, uh, because this will be uh, going on Game theory can be helpful to some extent. I mean, like if we, if we have to talk it from the, uh, we, we cannot miss out on the geopolitics. Um, the thing is how this nuclear order, if, even if we think in terms of new, uh, game theory, how this nuclear order, even if there are incremental benefits, can they really have some sort of payback? Because uh, that is the only way out. Uh, if countries believe that there is some or the other incentive, uh, particularly, you know, um, the countries that feel more threatened, like China, vis-a-vis -vis US and Russia, uh, the nuclear capability is much, uh, you know, uh, lower. So somehow that assurance has to be there. Um, uh, and and uh, once that factor plays in that, you know, there are incremental benefits for each and every one here, including the non-nuclear weapon states, I think, uh, can be you know those those incremental steps uh, to address this concept of mutual distrust uh, among the nuclear armed states and of course we have to understand that the salience upon nuclear weapons it has to be reduced whatever the requirement be because as i said it's a it's not an obligation uh, it's an ethical responsibility that we have towards our fellow human species thank you i'll go to the next question the next question is from mr ashutosh gupta and it's a very pertinent question. Uh, Ashutosh is asking, what is the role of non-nuclear states that are recognized economic powers in the world? And the example is Japan and Germany. What they can do to diffuse the situation and contribute towards universal nuclear disarmament? We have a huge role to play. This is a very critical question. In fact, um, um, we are the onus of nuclear disarmament is placed on the uh, the N5 countries. Uh, Dr. Adyanji, as you mentioned, uh, the P5 countries, the N5 countries. The onus is uh, placed on them, particularly again on US and Russia, because they uh, uh, have more than 90% of the global nuclear forces. But I believe that um, any nuclear, uh, any initiative towards nuclear disarmament uh, cannot be a complete, uh, you know, uh, initiative, a, a fulfilling initiative, if the non-nuclear states, non-nuclear weapon states, they are not playing their role. And I think in this context, countries like uh, economic clubs like Japan and Germany, they have a hugely important role to play. Uh, one uh, suggestion that I can make here is that uh, why don't the non-nuclear weapon states, they make a resolution, they move a resolution that, uh, you know, the need for um, uh, sort of um, uh, that all uh, safeguarded materials must be declared. 
at a global scale, you know, uh, uh, maybe in the UN, uh, uh, the non-nuclear weapon uh, states, they, they can pass a resolution of the like, uh, where, uh, you know, I know it's a tall order, it's a huge thing too, because there are so many military, uh, you know, uh, compulsions out here. But uh, I think this can be one step, uh, because the safeguarded materials, uh, the uh, uh, it's important that the uh, non the, the nuclear weapon states they must come more clear on the on their safeguarded materials and uh, a resolution of the like can be passed whereby they can demand that all safeguarded materials uh, should be declared. Uh, being economic clouds, uh, they have they can do it. They can use their economic clout to to, to you know uh, this or take the steps again and incremental steps. Okay, there's another question by Dr. Minaru, and I think you have touched upon it, but there's a very specific question. How do you see the possibility of this ongoing Ukraine-Russia conflict escalating to nuclear war? If so, the doctrine of nuclear disarmament is never going to rescue the world. What is your take on this? hope it never happens that's all i can say uh, i will keep my uh, you know uh, optimism high there because i don't think uh, the global nuclear order has uh, really collapsed to that extent where we can sort of you know see a uh, russia ukraine uh, the the ongoing crisis escalating to nuclear war but then as we know that you know you cannot predict anything and uh, uh, if not a deliberate and intentional uh, uh, possibility, there can be always miscalculations, there can be accidents, and it can, you know, uh, uh, uncontrolled escalation, as we understand Bernard Brody's concept, un uncontrolled escalation. Uh, we have heard extensively, the, there are extensive theories on that. So we cannot really overlook that. But um, uh, so far, um, this has. Uh, 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 I mean, the, the global out is uh, playing its role. The nuclear order is playing its role. It has not completely diminished. Uh, there are a lot of factors, including the civil society, the international non-governmental organizations. They are also working day and night to highlight the risks of nuclear war. So uh, I really don't see the possibility of the ongoing uh, Ukraine-Russia uh, crisis escalating to a nuclear war, as the optics suggest now. Um, so, uh, uh, that, that context, you know, having said that, obviously nuclear disarmament, um, uh, it be, it's not, uh, it's not, uh, uh, it's not going to happen immediately. Uh, I don't know, not in my lifetime, probably, but, uh, we can keep our hopes, uh, you know, high on this. Uh, and, but this is, uh, this, this can be possible only when we keep the dialogue. Uh, and disarmament diplomacy, you know, uh, ongoing. Thank you. Uh, I am taking another question on the same topic, just for sake of continuation, and I'll revert back to the order uh, questions are coming. This question is from Dr. Shrikant Chopra, who is a fellow Amsonian of mine. Uh, a very specific question about Russia-Ukraine status. If Russia uses a nuclear weapon against Ukraine, who would step to confront Russia? Will it be NATO or the United Nations? I, uh, it would be so tragic uh, that uh, in a nuclear weapon state uh, uses a nuclear weapon against a non-nuclear weapon state that had expressed faith in the NPT and uh, surrendered its own nuclear weapons, uh, this would really, you know, unravel uh, the NPT and, and weaken it to the extent that, you know, like, uh, I mean, non-nuclear weapon would, states would just lose faith in this uh, whole uh, treaty of uh, uh, NPT. So again, I I hope this does not happen. But uh, think of who would step in uh, to confront Russia uh, again on a. Uh, it have to uh, you know uh, 
apply the zero sum game out here. Uh, I mean, who would like to, uh, you know, put yourself, put oneself on the sacrificial, you know, uh, sort of. Uh, Peter. Britain, yeah. Who would like to kill? Britain? This is not NATO's nuclear war. This is not UN's nuclear war. UN, as in like the members uh, who are part of the UN, they are, it's not their nuclear war. So to expect that, you know, like uh, putting oneself, you know, on the becoming the sacrificial lamb, uh, because you are talking about nuclear weapons, uh, I think, you know, like uh, that's quite. Uh, one can be very uh, sort of skeptical there. I mean, I'm sounding very cynical, uh, but nobody would like to. Uh, we we already know belling the cat is very different, uh, difficult. So to expect that you know the NATO countries would affront, uh, you know, put themselves on the top uh, in a nuclear uh, situation, uh, I think uh, we we need to take a relook on that. There is a question from Dr. Vashishtha looking at a thousand years vision for humanity. Are nation states in a dysfunctional way organizing for the security uh, of humanity, but particularly what he means is nuclear armed states? Fortunately, yes. There's a lot of, uh, you know, the geopolitics are uh, being managed in such a way that uh, there are, there are purported uh, efforts. Uh, to sort of destabilize the domestic situation uh, in, you know, like uh, other countries. Um, there is a deliberate attempt uh, many a times as we see um, that, you know, uh, attempts are being made for dysfunctionality uh, to take place in uh, other countries, whether in the name of security, or whether in the name of protection of, uh, you know, humanity, uh, this is going on. Uh, and uh, it has its own pitfalls, uh, it backfires. Uh, we are seeing the same case in the, you know, the Ukraine crisis as well. So uh, while uh, uh, it's good to respond uh, or, or, you know, the, the, the concept of responsibility to protect, as we know, it is there. But uh, again, one needs to also be aware of uh, certain uh, limitations, certain rules. That is why we have the United Nations. Uh, it has its own limitations again, I understand. But bypassing and flouting uh, international laws, international conventions, treaties is also not the way out uh, of addressing, you know, uh, uh, problems. And because the result, the consequential effect again is dysfunctionality, which again leads to issues like, you know, the crisis that we are witnessing presently. Uh, my co host. Mr. Rikudaman Pachauri probably wanted to say something. Rikudaman, if you can unmute yourself. Actually, <laughs> no, I, I mistakenly um, click on that icon. And um, actually, I really wanted to uh, thank uh, uh, Dr. Kazmi, uh, for answering one of the questions that she mentioned uh, when someone asked, like um, uh, one of the questions, she she answered very nicely. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Well, thank you. Yeah. I I have a couple of questions. So, Professor Kazi, you mentioned that you know flouting the international treaties and obligations is not the surest way of ensuring security and contributing to the cause of disarmament. In that context, what do you think about Trump administration's withdrawal from the JCPO mechanism? That's one of the, uh, if, if I'm, uh, should I respond? Please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, again, that's one of the uh, you know, it's unbelievable. Uh, the JCPOA, after years of 
hard work, effort uh, that went in, in, in having that uh, important piece of arms control, which is again a very important uh, measure as far as the, you know, the West Asia, the nuclear scenario that we see in West Asia, uh, which is again, uh, you know, it's, it's a booming scenario there as well. And JCPOA was very important uh, measure in addressing the, you know, uh, the impending, uh, otherwise impending situation that we see uh, uh, in, in West Asia. Uh, Trump administration's uh, scrapping of the, you know, the withdrawal from the JCPOA has uh, really left things in the limbo. Because now uh, the situation is asking uh, Iran uh, to, you know, like uh, come back to the original uh, position. I think it will be uh, a very difficult scenario. Uh, what is the al alternative then? Uh, 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 do we tell Iran that, okay, business is over uh, and we are done with arms control measures, so nothing, no more now? Or do we have another, you know, a revised JCPOA with more stringent measures? The third alternative would be to, you know, uh, prevent Iran from going nuclear would be a military option. This is the scenario now. These are the optics that are in front of us. Of which the first and the second, I mean, the military option is completely out of, uh, you know, question. Even if, though we have it on the table, it's completely out of the question. Uh, uh, using the military card here, we already see the crisis that is going on in Europe. We do not want a similar crisis unfolding in the uh, in West Asia. So military option is completely out of control, uh, out of question. The first one, that is, you know, telling Iran, okay, business is over. You are, we are not having any more arms control measures with you. That is again, I, I think, uh, a very. Uh, uh, it, it's it's certainly not going to help uh, arms control measures initiatives. And again, uh, this will not also help nuclear disarmament process in the long run. So the only option now left is a second one. The thing is, will Iran agree to a revised JCPOA? It's a difficult scenario, but uh, one has to keep the dialogue on. Uh, one has to keep nuclear diplomacy on. I hope the Biden administration uh, sort of, you know, unveils mechanisms, unravels, um, other tools uh, whereby Iran can be got on board because uh, uh, the West Asian dynamics, they have a hugely important role to play uh, as far as arms control and nuclear disarmament is concerned. Uh, and of course, uh, how the global nuclear order plays out uh, will have a much important, you know, uh, this the West Asian dynamics, nuclear dynamics will have a very important role to play there. In the past, although there has been some efforts towards universal nuclear disarmament, I may say lip service, but the threat reduction has been achieved by focusing on single countries or encouraging individual countries to contribute to the cause. So one example is South Africa that voluntarily turned in its nuclear program and became in you know, declared on nuclear state. The threat of coercion, Libya did the same. At the time of breakup of former Soviet Union, Ukraine, Belarus, and Kazakhstan turned in their nuclear weapons. And whatever is happening right now, at least these were incremental country specific steps that reduce the threat of nuclear war. If we have take the same approach, how would you respond to nuclear status of two countries, UK and France, that are members of NATO, have extended deterrence from United States? Do they need their independent nuclear option? What are your thoughts on that? Uh for UK, we uh, are part of NATO, but the thing is, uh, which I explained uh, uh, earlier also, for, for UK nuclear disarmament, uh, you know, um, they want to remain as a global player. Uh, 
uh, and uh, they believe that nuclear weapons are a very important part of their defense uh, doctrine. Um, uh, they uh, are an important factor not only in safeguarding against uncertainties and risks, uh, but uh, it's a huge, uh, you know, they can have a clout on the United States uh, and the NATO strategies. Um, and, you know, uh, going by stock, uh, uh, Scott Sagan's uh, 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 theory, his narrative, uh, one of the reasons why nations go nuclear is the prestige factor. So for UK, it's a hugely important uh, issue as far as, you know, international stature and um, uh, prestige is concerned, given, you know, the past history. Um, uh, it's uh, they have it's not only something which is uh, in, intricately involved with their national security strategy but it is it has a normative you know benefit uh, and and uh, uh, added advantage for them as far as stature uh, is concerned national international stature and prestige is concerned for france uh, again quite you know uh, uh, similarly they we have seen that they're has been no significant movement on the part of France as far as nuclear disarmament is concerned. And uh, they have reservations again uh, against a no first use uh, policy. Uh, their nuclear disarmament, even though they have, I mean, they do have a nuclear disarmament policy, but again, it's premised on, you know, deterrence, nuclear deterrence. So for them, uh, given again its past history, uh, you know, France, for the sake of ensuring its um, territory, the safety of its people, and the sovereignty, uh, you know, so that it is not faced again a uh, territorial crisis uh, uh, that that threatens to deliver, you know, its unacceptable damage uh, to its own integrity and its own, to its own sovereignty. They have come out very clearly that whatever uh, in whatever form, you know, uh, nuclear threat that it comes uh, upon them in whatever form or shape, they will respond appropriately. So it's. Uh, Again, uh, it, it's uh, the salience upon nuclear weapons by, from both US and uh, from both UK and France, it remains undiminished. And um, this goes, you know, it just adds to the complexity of the issue. It's unfortunate. Talking about complexity of the issue, we have talked about N5 and non NPT N4. Time has come also to talk about non-state actors that actually always keep the sword of Democles hanging about use of a dirty bomb or a radiological device. So what in your viewpoint could be done to eliminate that threat from non-state actors? Uh, the, the nuclear security, uh, the very fact that we had four consecutive you know, summits uh, uh, during the nuclear security summits from 2010 to 2016, uh, the four summits that were held itself showed how, uh, you know, important this issue is. And um, if you go by the figures, uh, every summit uh, from 2010 to 2016, every summit, the uh, a number of members, uh, not only in terms of the, uh, the states, uh, but also as in like the countries, uh, but also international organizations, whether the Interpol, whether, you know, like uh, uh, other organizations, uh, they, the, the number just multiplied. So it shows, uh, you know, this, this very fact showed that how important the issue is, how serious the issue is, the concept of nuclear security. And one important, uh, you know, case in this, the AQ Khan case, it, uh, the, the operation, the unabated operation of the illicit, uh, you know, nuclear trafficking that took place uh, and, and then the uh, consequent, uh, you know, the revelations that took place. It remains a quite a quintessential example of how, you know, activities have weakened the foundation, the very foundation of the non-proliferation regime. And uh, when non-proliferation is, uh, efforts are, uh, weaken it also weakens the disarmament efforts too. What can be done again? Uh, this is uh, this is not something which can be done at a uh, you know only at a global uh, level. Um, for this, at every national level, 
all countries possessing these weapons uh, or running civil nuclear program or aspiring to do so um, uh, at a at an international level all horizontally um, you know they have to take efforts at national level they have to strengthen their export controls they have to strengthen their na domestic legislation to uh, improve uh, you know the the uh, status of their uh, nuclear security wm issues like for india we have in india we have the wmd act uh, which was again revised um, uh, in last year uh, uh, and and these sort of domestic legislations they have to be taken on uh, you know the regulatory mechanisms have to be in place you need to have nuclear uh, centers of excellence uh, that would call for sharing of best practices, not only amongst, uh, you know, training your own personnel, but also at a global level, at an international level with the nuclear watchdog that the IAEA, you know, like there has to be a complete collaboration uh, in a calibrated manner, uh, because this cannot be done in one single day. All these factors, you know, uh, all these efforts, they will have to add up. They need to add up uh, at a global level uh, where, you know, uh, 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 we can have uh, some mechanism institutionalized way, some, you know, mechanism should be there in order to uh, see that uh, incidents like the AQ Khan case uh, does not happen again. In any case, the AQ Khan case, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I must say that it still remains an unresolved because mere house arrest uh, of the, uh, you know, uh, the, the main, uh, you know, sort of, a culpable person out here uh, was not enough. Uh, I think there is, there still remains much more to be unraveled there. Uh, and it's, um, we don't know, whatever was uh, discovered, whatever was revealed was only the tip of the iceberg. But I believe there's much more to it. So, uh, uh, regulate, not only the regulatory mechanisms, but also, uh, you know, the, uh, at a global level, the Interpol, um, they need to work out more effectively. Um, and also at the domestic level, you know, the police, the, the detectives, uh, the, the forensics, nuclear forensics, all these, uh, they have a, you know, hugely important role to play in order to address this very complex uh, and again, a very dangerous issue. Thank you. No discussion of universal nuclear disarmament is complete without some talk about FMCT and the failure to negotiate it. What are your views on that? Um, I uh, this is a topic which I feel uh, you know I, I'm I'm literally uh, quite jittery when I'm talking about it, uh, particularly when I'm addressing my students on this matter, because we know even after so many years, the FMCT does not even have a written text, it does not have a written treaty text like CTBT, which has a text. The FMCT does not have a text. So that itself again shows that, you know, uh, how serious, uh, I mean, you may on paper countries, non-nuclear weapon states, they have, uh, sorry, nuclear weapon states, they have uh, professed uh, their commitments towards, you know, uh, uh, towards uh, sort of uh, uh, mitigating the production of uh, fissile material. Uh, India for one has stopped the production of uh, highly enriched uranium. Uh, so does, you know, China also claims the same, but where are the transparency uh, 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 is that transparent? Uh, is that being reported uh, at a global level? Does that assure the international community? Yes, these, uh, you know, like uh, uh, China is, uh, has really stopped, you know, production of highly enriched uranium. Um, so, uh, and uh, the other countries, as the United States for that matter, you know, like uh, uh, the FMCD is held up on the grounds of verification. Uh, I think um, uh, there has to be some sort of, you know, uh, congruence uh, has to be, you know, worked out. There has to be more dialogue, more transparency, uh, more verification. Uh, you know, sort of mechanisms need to work out. But you know, considering the way things are uh, happening at present, uh, uh, the New Star Treaty, the situation that we are facing there, which was an important verification, you know, like a mechanism. Uh, I don't know how uh, this, uh, the impact of it would definitely have a very, it, it would be a very negative impact. So um, FMCT, which is again a very important, uh, you know, arms control measure uh, and uh, one of those uh, very critical uh, in incremental steps towards nuclear disarmament. Uh, it's a 
is a major part of this whole puzzle uh, within this uh, nuclear disarmament. Uh, and without that, uh, you know, that missing puzzle, uh, without that uh, completing that puzzle, we cannot uh, really move towards nuclear disarmament. So one needs to, we need to put more effectively, we need to invest more effectively uh, on the issue of FNC. Talking about nuclear disarmament, you now a leader needs to lead by example. And when the survival of humanity is concerned, entire humanity, all of us come near spirituality. You know, in some circles, talk about nuclear disarmament is almost like a theology. So taking that theological analogy, concept of original sin, making confession for the same, would it be a global gesture on part of the United States government to formally and publicly apologize for use of nuclear weapons in Hiroshima and Nagasaki as a confidence building measure? to the cause of universal nuclear disarmament. Any comments on that suggestion? Uh, I don't think everybody can apologize, but, the, but uh, you know, uh, uh, countries or people who uh, are that have apologized in the past or uh, has the mentality to apologize, uh, I think they are very brave. And uh, they are all ethically, they hold uh, a lot of responsibility. Uh, now, having said that, uh, why just United States? I think uh, every country, it's uh, nuclear, the, it's not just the use of nuclear weapons, but a very, uh, you know, even the concept of the threat to use nuclear weapons, that itself also is so, it's so damaging. So, uh, Going by that yardstick, every country that has even you know, issued threats to use nuclear weapons, they should also apologize. The leadership be taken by United States because it's the only country that has used it. I think Russia can also <laughs> join there. <laughs> Russia has not used it so far. <laughs> I think that yeah. will prevent Russia from crossing the Rubicon. Well, when I know my own fellow being, my 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 fellow human species are at stake, I would go to any extent. Okay. Uh, in this context, you know the case brought by Marshall Islands in the International Court. I think those kind of measures or those kind of you know legal maneuvers would be successful in reducing the threat of a nuclear war. In reality, it has not made, uh, you know, uh, if we see in tangible terms, it has not made much of a difference. But the very fact that it has been brought to the knowledge of the people, there is a level of awareness. People are more conscious. Countries are more conscious of the suffering of, you know, uh, your fellow human beings, fellow, uh, uh, we are all part of this, you know, planet. The very fact that one, you know, like uh, even if it's a speck on the planet, but it's a it's a place um, you, you can go there, you can visit there, just as you can go to uh, Fukushima. But people are scared to go there. Why? Because of the tragic, the disaster. That took place. Uh, I don't think any part of the world should uh, become so fearsome or or become so, you know, like uh, sort of, you know, uh, it, sh it should not project those negativity. Uh, that you know you cannot come here because we have some inherent problems out here. Uh, it that should not happen. This is a beautiful planet, uh, and every part of the planet uh, should be kept you know safe and beautiful. So uh, even it did not make uh, any difference on tangible uh, you know uh, at a tangible level, uh, but I think it has raised a lot of awareness, a lot of consciousness, and that is what we need. You know, in order to have this debate, the dialogue process on. There is a uh, there is an effort which I think the international uh, non-governmental organizations are doing very consciously uh, and very effectively 
uh, that is to raise the level of consciousness. And I think uh, these kind of uh, exercises has uh, done a you know a noble job uh, in raising that level of consciousness amongst the people. With those uplifting messages and words for humanity, uh, we are very very thankful to Professor Reshmi Kazi come to our platform, uh, deliver her distinguished lecture and participate in discussion. So we are very, very grateful and thankful to you. I'm also thankful to our audience who on a weekend, you know, have spent their hour and 15 minutes on this program. And finally, I am thankful to Team CSA Mr. Ripudaman Pachauri, Mr. Rajiv Verma, and Mr. Ankush Bhandari, who always are pillars of support for me to conduct these kind of important events that raise our level of awareness. As I said, CSA hopes to aim to increase world peace and prosperity. This discussion was highly educating. And I thank everyone who was part of this meeting, especially Professor Kazi. And with those words, we'll end this meeting. And we hope to have you again on the platform. Thank you so much for having me here, Dr. Adyan And thank you, uh, Riku Daman uh, uh, and all the other organizers. I was very happy to you know, present my views here. Uh, thank you so much to the, all the distinguished uh, guests for their questions. Uh, thank you for educating me too. Thank you so much. Have a nice weekend, all of you. Okay. <laughs>